Hey folks, Nathan here. It's been a while since I've done any kind of gaming related video on this channel. Uh, primarily I've been focusing in on from the Star Wars home video library and that sort of thing to kind of keep building that up. But now that that's past episode 400 and I've got something really cool to show here, I wanted to take the time to do a quick sort of unboxing video of something a little bit unusual here. Uh, as you can probably tell by looking here at the table, um, I've kind of become a bit of a fanboy for the tiny epic games from Gamelin Games here in the last few years. I got into it around the time that Ultra Tiny Epic Galaxies was on Kickstarter and there were late pledges available for Tiny Epic Tactics and its expansion and just basically sort of gobbled everything up after that point, went back and sort of hunted down anything that I didn't have uh, yet. I wound up picking up all the different playmats. They are huge in many cases, uh, a lot of uh, storage issues with those, but very, very sweet playmats. Only one showing up here. This is from Tiny Epic Pirates, and that is just so that we have a little bit less of a glary background when I'm showing you the main stuff here in just a moment. But you can kind of see there, uh, going across on the back left, we have Tiny Epic Kingdom's first edition, and then below that, the second edition with its Heroes Call expansion. We have Tiny Epic Defenders first edition with its second edition and its expansion, the Dark War with it, both of those kind of having those little uh, paper wraps around them to hold the two standard size boxes together. We have Tiny Epic Galaxies. You might be saying, wait a second, why is there multiple copies of Tiny Epic Galaxies? The top one there is actually a first printing from whenever they basically had the yellow components have white uh, symbols and stuff on them, making them a little bit tougher to read. So it is a first printing. Then I have a later printing, I believe the third underneath that, along with its expansion Beyond the Black, which then has its band around it. Over there to the right, we've got the stack of sort of the standalone Tiny Epic Games, a Tiny Epic Mechs. Western, Zombies, Dinosaurs, and Quest. I am particularly fond of Quest uh, uh, and of Kingdoms and Defenders from those early ones. Um, then Tiny Epic Galaxies Blast Off, sort of their chance to sort of get to a broader market by retooling and somewhat simplifying Tiny Epic Galaxies. Uh, then they're laying on the table. We have Tiny Epic Tactics with its expansion, which is basically a terrain type of expansion. They call it the Maps expansion, but it changes the terrain that you can play on. It's kind of hard to explain. Then we've got Tiny Epic Pirates and its expansion over there off to the right. Notice both of those have a smaller expansion boxes, one of them kind of flimsy for tactics, uh, one sort of standard thickness uh, in terms of the actual walls of the box, but smaller in size for pirates. That's what the expansion for the one we're going to look at here in a moment is going to look like when it eventually gets released to retail and to Kickstarter backers. Running down the center, we have Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms in its little special baggie that comes with uh, a die, which is sort of a bonus uh, for that from Kickstarter. Uh, also has a sleeve around the actual uh, you know, package for the cards. Then Ultra Tiny Epic Galaxy is the first one I ever backed. And then Tiny Epic Western is just regular old playing cards. And I got so fanboyish into this stuff that I even hunted down Michael Coe of Gamelin Games' uh, big sort of first attempt at dungeon crawling through a couple of Kickstarters called Dungeon Heroes. And if that sounds familiar, it's because recently in the Tiny Epic Dungeons Kickstarter, they have uh, made available in the Pledge Manager this basically sort of deluxe upgraded version of Dungeon Heroes, a limited version, um, that actually comes with its expansion already included within it. But I hunted down an original copy of Dungeon Heroes and Dick's expansion, which is kind of the weird one here with Dragon and the Damsel. But then the other side, Lords of the Undead. It's essentially two expansions in one box. So I was very excited at the idea of a new Tiny Epic Kickstarter coming out, and I really enjoyed the idea of the, you know, kind of standard dungeon crawler, right? Uh, that was the one thing I was really hoping someday they would make for Tiny Epic, but I felt like, you know what, maybe since they already did Dungeon Heroes, even though it's not really epic in sort of the typical Tiny Epic sense, maybe they're just not going to do it. And at the same time, I was promising myself that someday, just like I've enjoyed doing for some other Kickstarters where you can like get your name in something or get a you know card named after you. I had a card uh, in Shadows of Killforth named after my son and that sort of thing. Uh, I actually appear in the Novus Community Expansion for Master of Wills. Um, I thought, you know what? It'd be kind of cool to do that for Tiny Epic because they always have this pledge level that gives you some extra bonuses and actually lets you be a so-called honorary producer that's credited in the rule book. And it's the bonus stuff that's really kind of the, the cool part there, uh, aside, you know, it's nice to have the name in the rule book, and it's the cool, you know, early stuff that you wind up getting that's kind of the, the standout. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it at some point, I just got to wait for a tiny epic that really, really hits the exact spot that I'm looking for for a game. And sure enough, 
that finally happened with Tiny Epic Dungeons, the answer to the type of game I wanted to see for ages and giving an opportunity to do that. So I did the honorary producer level backing of a game called Tiny Epic Dungeons, which allows for multiple things. Um, you wind up basically, uh, it's a $255 pledge for the game, but you basically get um, the deluxe version of the base game, which means the base game and its potions and perils expansion. You get the regular expansion, which is the stories expansion, and you actually get those early because instead of waiting for it to trek its way by ship across the ocean when the final product is ready, it gets sent directly from China so they can go straight to you and you'll get it earlier than anybody else. But on top of that, you also get your name in the rule book. And on top of that, you get an autographed little sort of certificate. And you get the premium print and play files where you could sort of make your own copy of the game early. But on top of that, you get sort of a weird special thing that we're going to see in this video as an unboxing, which is a premium prototype, they call it. Basically using the premium print and play PNP files to create a print on demand version of the game as a prototype using was essentially prototype components like they would be using when developing the game rather than the finished physical components to go with the cards. It's an unusual thing and my guess is only 20 of these exist because there are only 20 people at that honorary producer pledge level. That is what we're going to look at this time and that is this. The Tiny Epic Dungeons Premium Prototype. This includes the base game, Potions of Perils, which is part of the deluxe version of the base game, and the stories expansion all in one box. We're gonna see what the prototype is and just kind of how that works and maybe this will entice others to someday back at that honorary producer pledge as well for another tiny epic game because it really is pretty sweet and it's here in June of 2021 as promised in its fulfillment date and we're still months away from the actual physical game being released even to those honorary producers who get the finished version early. Uh, the PNP is out. Nothing physical, officially, except these. Let's take a look. Okay, so we have the box here. Uh, a Dangerous Dungeon Crawler by Scott Alms. I believe I'm saying that correctly. My apologies if I am not. Gamelin Games. It does say prototype here, actually on the box itself. Had your tiny epic dungeon stuff on one side that tells you the player count of one to four. Playtime, ages... Okay, notice it does pop up a little bit because there's a lot of stuff crammed into this box. And then there's your box back here. Love the fact that they always tell you what defines a tiny epic game, basically uh, the concept behind it, because they could take up a heck of a lot of space on a table, you know, like with the playmat here for tiny epic pirates. But the idea is that typically there's a small footprint or a relatively small footprint as part of this, but not always. Just, you know, short playtime, high replayability, small box, low downtime, high strategy, easy entry kind of stuff here. So, taking off our lid. Uh, and again, the lid is just kind of like a standard lid here, if anybody cares about that. We have our manual, adventures manual here. Flip and flip, you notice. Um, for those who followed along with the campaign, this is sort of the newest version as of right now as I'm recording this of the manual because it doesn't include that lose condition where if a character is unconscious in a room with an enemy and not another hero is there, then the game is over. That was removed. Uh, what's interesting here is once you get to the back, it does fold out for the last pages there. And there's your icon reference that folds out so you can get all the information you need. This is a game that relies heavily on iconography, not so much on uh, text on the actual cards itself. Then you have your manual there for stories, relatively small here. And the little manual, little rule sheet for potions and perils, which is the little expansion that comes in the deluxe edition of the game, available through Kickstarter. Eventually, if you missed it, um, sometimes these wind up on Board Game Geek just as separate little mini expansions. If you get the retail version, you just kind of slide it in. But you can also usually get the deluxe version of the game through uh, the Gamelin Games website once it's actually been fulfilled to everybody else. Now we got the actual contents here. We got kind of a bag of big cards, our various tokens and whatnot. Um, this is all uh, stuff that fits the idea that this is a prototype. It is not final components. They're basically placeholder components, but it's pretty cool the way they've handled those. Sort of custom-made dice here with stickers used to place the symbols on them that we'll look at. 
and then your different small cards as well. Then your box bottom is just kind of the standard white. We'll start with the dice in the prototype. Again, they're kind of just sort of a, a standard type of die, each of them is, with sort of a flat face, and they put stickers on each face, printed stickers, for each thing that's supposed to happen. Um, you can sort of see this here under the light. You can't see it as well here with the camera, where you've got the lightning bolt there, where you get a focus back if this is an unused die. Um, probably eventually talk about that in like a regular video for the game, but there are three of those. And then you've got one in similar style, the way that it's um, put together here for the enemies die that they typically use on counterattacks. Then we got a whole bunch of big cards here. This is your torch track mat here. Uh, this is going to have act one on one side, act two on the other. Uh, I must say very impressed with the quality of these cards. I was thinking since this is a premium prototype, uh, from the print and play that this is going to be something where it's just like printed in the office or something like it'd be on like regular card stock or something and then you know maybe you needed to put it inside you know card sleeves or something in order to actually have it look good but no i mean this is nice card stock feels like it's linen finish it's much more print on demand it seems like based on uh, one of the ways the description is worded in the kickstarter campaign rather than just something produced kind of there in the office very very impressed by the quality of this as a premium prototype then we have our big cards from the main game. Uh, you can tell they're from the main game because of a little symbol up here in the corner. Okay, so let's focus in here a little better. There we go. We have Sir Lannan, Etherna, Gruckol, Thornton Firebraid, Uliessa, Moonblade, Jaren the Blue, and Win Kilas. Then we have our bosses from the base game, including the Pharaoh, the Seer, the Goblin King, the Hydra, the Gorgon. Particularly fond of that art for some reason. It's kind of a, a cool take on the Gorgon there with the, the way the face is designed. And the Dragon. Uh, notice, by the way, looking at Etherna, looking at Moonblade, uh, that they did, even before the campaign started, take all the criticism uh, into account and did some updating to the art so it's not quite as revealing. That was something that had upset quite a few people prior to the actual campaign launching on Kickstarter. Then you've got your two bosses that come from Potions and Perils, the uh, Deluxe Edition's little mini-expansion. Notice the little symbol there, the little potion thing with a P on it. We have the Lich, kind of glowy, and the Demon Lord. And then we have the ones from the Stories expansion, that is the regular expansion here. Notice the S there. Uh, Zazili, Sir Gamelin, he finds himself into a lot of these games. Clotho, Zui Jiang, I suppose, Pandaman. Evelyn, a Taurus, Laura Gambit, kind of the oddball one, kind of the Laura Croft meets Indiana Jones kind of character there. Uh, Neely Songheart, then that brings us into the bosses, which includes the Tinkerer and the Mind Lasher. So you basically have eight playable characters and six bosses in the base game. You have two more bosses if you get the deluxe version that includes potions and perils. And then in the story expansion, you've got eight heroes and then two bosses. Then we have 28 dungeon cards in the base game. You've got the entrance. You've got the uh, boss lair door, basically. And then you have four encounter rooms uh, that's going to bring your minions into play. And then you've got basically 22 regular rooms here. The rooms have no names. They just have their various iconography and whatnot. Like, that's a search ability. Uh, you got a trap in this particular room. That's where a goblin's going to come in and so on and so on and so on here. I take that back, actually. That's like a danger type thing where you check for danger. That's a standard trap room here. Trap on the one side. Possible disarm thing on the other side here. But you got basically six little kind of oddball rooms here. Then you've got nine that can pull a goblin on you. Right? Okay. 
and then seven that are various forms of traps. Now, I should note that all of those are basically from the base game. Uh, from the deluxe version with Potions and Perils, you also get Mixie's Lab here. Uh, notice the potion as part of it and a little marker up in the corner. The storage expansion then adds five more of various types, including the important Stairs Down. Uh, so if you're playing a multi-level dungeon, the epic dungeon, then this becomes a crucial component for that Stairs Down symbol here. Uh, notice they also have the little S for the stories expansion. Then you have your minions, the ones that come out with those uh, encounter locations. You have to kill a certain number of these, depending on the player count, to actually be able to get into the boss's lair once you've got the door card uh, showing up here. The base game has eight. Notice base game symbol. We have the ogre, the ooze, skeleton, dire serpent, minotaur, dungeon crawler, appropriate, Troglodyte, Troll, we're back to the Ogre here, and then each of the expansions, both mini and regular, come with two more minions. So in Potions and Perils, we have the Vampire Imp and the Wraith, that's the Potions and Perils symbol, and then in Stories, we've got the Fire Elemental and the Golem. Then we have the Goblin cards. Uh, goblins will be a constant bane of your existence. They are weak but they can come after you, and if you ever have more than four, or are supposed to draw a fifth after there already are four out there, game is over, you lose. You've been basically overrun. The base game comes with uh, six different, well, six goblins of four different types. There are a couple of duplicate pairs. So you have two copies of the Boomy Goblin, two copies of the Stabby Goblin, but then we have the Shooty Goblin and the Pokey Goblin, not to be confused with a Pokemon. This is not a Mon, he's a Goblin. The deluxe version with Potions and Perils adds two copies of the Mixie Goblin. Can Potion there, Potions and Perils. Then Stories adds the Mighty Goblin, which I believe is like the toughest possible one, and the Spelly Goblin. Now before we get into loot and spells, let's check out the other card components, uh, in this case that are from the expansions. In the Stories expansion, you have eight different story cards that give you different scenarios to play. Uh, they have sort of a quick little flavor text thing, a setup, your objective, and any special rules, conditions for what success means, what failure might mean, and so on and so forth, can be used in conjunction with other aspects of the expansion and whatnot here, but there are eight of those. Purify the Aquifer, the Golden Phoenix, the Pyrotechnic Heist, Scry into the Future, a Dimensional Debt, Curse of the Hobgoblin, Rescue the Adventurers, Sacrifice a Minion. Then Potions and Perils provides you with some potion cards, a new type of loot, basically, um, but they kind of come at a cost, right? There's something you get, but when you draw it in the first place, something bad is going to typically happen to you or to everyone here. Uh, and it does have that little symbol up there. So it's kind of like in this case, you know, get back your maximum focus, but at what cost to acquire the potion in the first place? Um, hence, potions and perils. Potion, peril. We have a magic elixir, healing potion, both pretty straightforward. Bottle O Energy, Haste Drought, Mind Tonic, Epic Mugga Ale, Witch's Brew, Strength Filter. Guess that's how you're supposed to pronounce that. Strength Filter. Now, for what it's worth, that is all of potions and perils. Uh, with the exception of the fact that uh, it would include two tokens, one for each of the two new minions being introduced in that particular little mini expansion. We're going to find that that's handled a little bit differently with the premium um, prototype version here. But that brings us to spells. Oddly enough, the only spells are in the base game. There's no spells introduced with the mini expansion or the regular expansion stories. Now, these are all kind of their own thing. There are no sets to acquire or anything. So we have a Cloud of Death, Conjurer's Gambit, Tempest of Arrows, Invisibility, Chain Lightning, Fireball, Giant's Strength, Dungeon Scry, Elemental Charge, Holy Abundance, Batman, Deliverer's Luck, Eagle's Swiftness, Dark Bargain, Claw of Darkness, then we're back to Cloud of Death. I would point out here, 
Uh, there's been some question about what's going on with this symbol here. Okay, uh, It's explained, but it's explained in a way that's confused a lot of people. Uh, basically, an orange plaque for a symbol for some type of action is a free action. A blue one is a heroic action. You can only do one of those per turn. This is basically a free action of some kind. Uh, sometimes there'll be a symbol on it, sometimes just a question mark where you can choose. But the idea is it's a free heroic action, right? You wouldn't want to use it on a free action because free actions are always free anyway. But you get an extra free heroic action. And it says 1x. What this means basically is that this can't trigger this more than once per turn. So if I use invisibility, I pay my two focus to get the ability to move by stealth and an extra heroic action, and I somehow later trigger this again, like say, you know, doing the heroic action of doing another spell, doing well, and going right back here, you know, kind of use invisibility and then use it again, then when I pay my two, I can get this a second time. I can't get this a second time. I've already used that effect for that particular turn. That's basically all that it means. Then we come to what all adventurers in a dungeon want. Loot, right? Loot here. Um, there are 26 loot cards in the base game. There is another 12 that comes in the stories expansion. So we'll start with the ones that are not part of sets here from the base game. We have the Sun Hammer, the Ruby Figurine, the Violet Cape, the Elven Chain, the Spiked Buckler, the Jade Figurine, the Crossbow, the Amethyst Figurine, the Hookshot, somebody's been playing a lot of Zelda, the Cursed Dragon Scale, but then we're into these types that have an of the something with an animal. So we got 10 that aren't part of a set, and then we got the animal sets. The idea of the animal sets, and there are four in the base game because there are four items each, is that it's like getting, you know, if you're playing a video game and you've got loot where you have different armor pieces of different types or whatever, different gear of different types, and they have bonuses that kind of stack on each other, that kind of thing. That's basically what you're getting with these sets as you try to make your gear basically match. So the of the bear stuff has the bear symbol here. And this is something where when you do a melee attack, you get a plus one, plus two, or plus three bonus, depending on whether you have two, three, or four items of that set. If it's just one, you don't get any bonus from any matching because you haven't matched anything yet. But we have here the uh, studded jerkin of the bear, throwing axes of the bear, the great axe of the bear, and the war horn of the bear. You notice the different types here, by the way. This is your garb. You can have one of these. You can have two things that use a hand. And then you can have two trinkets. You also have two spells, two potions here. You know that because on your character mat or character sheet, whatever you want to call it, you have a place for your garb, two hands which cover up an ability that already exists. Then it does tell you about the limit on the two spell and trinket. Uh, potions basically works the same way, except since potions are not part of the regular base game, it's not on the character mat slash card slash whatever. So that was of the bear. Then we have of the phoenix. So we have the phoenix set here. Phoenix there. We have robes of the phoenix. Great staff of the phoenix. I don't know why I pronounced it that way. Spell tome of the phoenix and ring of the phoenix. Uh, where basically anytime you use a spell, you get plus one, plus two, or plus three focus, depending on the set. Then we have the lion set. Uh, saw this work very well in a playthrough that I watched. Uh, we have a shield of the lion. We have greaves of the lion. We have plate mail of the lion. And the long sword of the lion, which as you increase the number of them that you have, that lion there, every time you do a melee attack, you get additional health back. Then we have Claw of the Panther, which for a ranged attack is going to be able to give you, or I guess I call it a missile attack, it's going to give you uh, additions to your rolls, which is nice, uh, for two, three, or four. So we have Claw of the Panther, Glove of the Panther, Cloak of the Panther, and Longbow of the Panther to round out the core box. Then, like I said, there are 12 in the stories expansion. It's basically four that are not part of sets and then two sets. So we have the dungeon map, bed rolls, the everlit torch, and the ceremonial spear. That's the S there for stories. Then we have the different sets. We have fangs of the viper, 
eyes of the viper. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, sorry, tiger. Shadow Gi and smoke pellets, both also of the viper. And in this case, basically, when um, the torch track does something that's going to cause uh, an enemy attack to be revealed, then two enemies in your same room, you're able to deal minus one, minus two, or minus three damage, basically, there. And notice here, again, so that red symbol, melee one, basically meaning, okay, once, when you do a melee attack, if they're successful, you have the ability to basically jump to another dungeon tile. Um, but you can only do that once. Otherwise, regular successful melee attacks won't be adding an ability to do that again or anything. Then we have our other set here, the Of the Scarab set. Uh, so we have the Orbs of the Scarab, Mage Blade of the Scarab, Ward of the Scarab, and Vestment of the Scarab. In this case, when you do a melee attack, you are increasing basically your defense value in case there was a counterattack to that. And enemies will always counterattack as long as they are within line of sight of you. And they react with an attack or a counterattack that is specific to the type of attack you used in the first place. That's what that enemy die is for most of the time. So that's all stuff you're going to see in just like a regular game, right? Uh, there might be slight variations on the cards as they continue to balance stuff before the final printing of it. But generally speaking, that is what you're going to see in the regular game. But this is a premium prototype, which means that all the other components basically haven't been produced yet. They are not final. There aren't special uh, you know, shapes of tokens that are available. The miniatures have not been produced as part of this or anything like that. So what's really kind of cool about this being a prototype and being able to compare this later to having the finished game is that it basically has sort of proxy tokens and whatnot to be able to let you play that are easily recognizable, but which are not the final components. This really kind of, I hate to use the word tickled me, but I almost gleefully giggled upon seeing this stuff. It was so cool to me, and I'm such a fanboy for this stuff and love this particular game concept from them. So, rather than player minis, and you would have basically a total of eight minis in the base game and eight minis in the stories expansion to represent your characters, you instead have these four colored pawns, basically. And they're just these little dudes, kind of cut off at the waist, head, arms, and torso in red, yellow, blue, and green. Then throughout the game, you may have as many as four goblins out at a time. Again, if a fifth needs to come out, then the game is over. So you need a way to mark that. In the retail or the finished version of the game, you're going to be able to have these little you know, meeples that look like little goblins that have little numbers on them and everything to match their little spots on the torch uh, track card and all that kind of stuff. Well, for the prototype... It's four little meeples, right? You have purple, green, orange, and blue. And you may also, depending on your player count, have as many as four minions to keep track of. Similarly, just with bigger, larger, regular meeples here. Uh, presumably from maybe some of their earlier games is where this type of a component perhaps was coming from. Uh, but again, same colors as the goblins. Then on the torch track, during a regular game, you're going to have a little, uh, you know, torch-shaped little marker. Here it's just a little, what is that, an a octagon? I don't know, a, what do you call a cylindrical octagon? I'm not up on my 3D object terminology here for this kind of thing, but a little orange marker. You'll need to track the health of minions and be able to mark those on the back of the boss layer card to know how many minions have been defeated so you know when the boss card can be flipped when you enter the layer or when you can even enter the layer at all. In the finished game, it's going to be these gray little heart tokens. Here is just four gray little cubes. Kind of a tiny epic kingdom or ultra tiny epic kingdoms style. You'll also need to track the health of up to four players instead of a red little wooden heart for each one. Red little cubes. You'll also need to track focus for up to four characters instead of little yellow lightning bolts. Shocker, no pun intended. We have four little yellow cubes. Then as you play, you'll need to keep track of up to a possible maximum of five altar locations. Uh, one 
on the entrance and then one on each of the cards, the encounter cards that are revealing the minions in the first place. In the finished game, these are going to be kind of little um, sort of custom wooden symbol things that have like a little um, uh, kind of just a weird sort of almost a cult looking symbol, but not really type of symbol on them that matches the rooms themselves uh, that basically match that symbol here, right? Well, again, you don't have anything like that in the prototype. Instead, it's five little black round tokens. There will also be times where you disarm a trap using a heroic action, typically uh, after dealing with the effects of a trap, if you don't want to just keep moving along uh, and leave it sitting there. Well, the disarm tokens in the finished game are going to look kind of like a gear, be gray, and have like a little keyhole looking symbol uh, cut into the center of them. For the premium prototype, seven little gray square pieces. And you're going to need to keep track of where the boss is. And somewhat controversially, I would say, uh, based on the Kickstarter comments and everything, um, the actual boss is represented in the finished game by a black token that has the boss symbol on it, but it's the same regardless of which boss you're playing against, unless you pay for an extra pack of wooden meeples designed to look like each individual boss. So it's going to come with four meeples designed to look like each uh, of four different types of goblins, the ones from the base game, numbered, uh, you only need four ever anyway. Um, for the minions, it's going to come with a little wooden cut meeple for each of the specific minions. But for the boss, it's just one that's used no matter what. That's just the boss symbol, unless you buy a pack that includes all the different bosses as special individual wooden meeples. Uh, but for the prototype, none of that stuff exists. It is basically just a black little kind of pawn here, kind of a standard little pawn, which interestingly is taller than these guys, so it kind of makes sense that it's the boss looming over them. Then Potions of Perils doesn't add any more physical little like marker components like that, but then the stories uh, is going to include different modes that might increase the number of these sort of standard tokens that you're going to need when it comes to the boss, because there could be two, or when it comes to the minions and their health. So they add two more minion health tokens. They add one more boss pawn. Uh, in the actual finished game, it'll be the same little token as in the base game, except the base game one is black and the storage expansion one is red, hence the colors of these pawns. I love the fact that they made the colors still match in most cases, except maybe the torch. I think the torch might be green in the final one. Um, but very, very cool they did that. And of course, the meeples, obviously kind of a different thing. But I'm talking about the tokens themselves, like the regular tokens. And then when you're playing the stories mode, there will be objectives, where you need objective tokens to mark certain locations. And the game will typically come... Uh, or the expansion will typically come with two different markers, one marked A, one marked B. Uh, a is red, and B is brown. Nothing like that here, so it's a pair of little tiny cylinders. One red, one brown, matching the colors we would come to expect for the expansion. So yeah, super, super excited. I actually get to play Tiny Epic Dungeons now in this prototype form. I cannot wait for the finished version with the minis and the custom tokens and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I've been chomping at the bit to play this thing. I almost broke down and printed out the print and play stuff myself before this wound up reaching me in June on the off chance that it might have gotten delayed at all. And of course it didn't. They delivered right on time uh, for the uh, premium prototype here, the print on demand prototype, whatever you want to call it based on the way they describe it on the page there. So if you are someone who enjoys the tiny epic games, then an honorary producer pledge may be something to consider. It is quite a bit more than buying the game. And of course, that's also going to mean that if you want to get the play mat later, the player mats later, uh, a carrying case, and so on and so on. In this case, uh, the boss meeples and so on. All these little extras that are available. Then, yeah, that's on top of already paying quite a bit more through your pledge on Kickstarter for honorary producer. But honorary producer, at least in this case, again gets you the deluxe Kickstarter version 
of the regular game for Tiny Epic Dungeons that includes the mini expansion Potions and Perils, and then gets you the expansion, which is the Stories expansion, the main expansion. It gets you all of those, and typically within any of these Kickstars, it gets you all of whatever the product is that's being offered, but you get it early because they're going to ship it directly to you or ship it from China to them and then them directly to you, whatever, rather than it going through the ocean freight process, which right now is completely foobar. So who knows how big of a jump it's going to be for the honorary producer 20 to be able to actually get their finished versions of the game and the expansion uh, before everybody else does. I'm assuming all the other stuff because it's not actually part of the pledge itself. It's something done in the pledge manager, uh, like the playmat and stuff will come later on with everybody else's. But also, you get an autograph certificate, you get your name in the manual, which in this case, the credits page is right here, and there I am. Um, but you get your name in the manual, uh, and early on in the process, once the premium print and play is available, you get a prototype version of the game using the premium print and play through a print-on-demand service, presumably, with proxy components to allow you to fully play the game without needing to wait months for the finished product. And again, even if the idea of using proxy components doesn't appeal to you, I think it's kind of quaint and kind of cool, um, especially to be able to compare it later on to the finished product here. Um, it's an incredibly limited type of thing. Aside from, you know, maybe reviewers out there who have received copies, there should only be 20 people in the world who have this or however many honorary producer pledges are available for that particular game for its Kickstarter. Uh, no idea what the next Tiny Epic game will be. I will definitely be on it as well. Um, I do not think I'll be doing honorary producer anytime in the near future again though, um, just because this was such a special thing for me because I love the concept of a dungeon crawler Tiny Epic and it just sort of screamed at me, this is the one to do it for. Um, but I might. You never know. Uh, it certainly was a worthwhile venture this time uh, as I'm about to dive into some more play with Tiny Epic Dungeons. Uh, I know a lot of folks on the Facebook page for Tiny Epic fans uh, when I showed that this had arrived wanted to see an unboxing. I hope this has uh, fulfilled that desire, uh, even with my long-winded introduction there. Uh, my thanks, of course, also to Michael Coe and Scott Alms and the whole team over there for the Tiny Epic Games over at Gamelin Games. Um, I had no idea the quality level of the premium prototype would be this high. Um, definitely uh, something that I'm really, you know, excited about upon finally getting it into my hands here. Believe it or not, even more than when I was just anticipating getting it in my hands. So uh, my thanks to those guys. Uh, they put together some fantastic games.